So the last talk of this little session, the bounded suboptimal search, direct approach using inadmissible estimates. Uh, it's going to be given by Jordan uh, Thayer, and it's a uh, joint work with Wheeler Rommel. And uh, you can read all that, but I'm supposed to say it anyway. Okay, take it. Thanks, John. All right, so uh, I suppose the place to start is with what bounded suboptimal search is in general, in case you all haven't seen it before. So solving problems optimally is hard. It's very, very hard. And so one thing we often do is we relax this quiet requirement on optimal solving in order to solve solutions faster. The, uh, so A star search is an optimal search algorithm. I assume most of us here know that. Uh, greedy search is as relaxed as you can really get in terms of solving a problem uh, suboptimally. In fact, it provides no guarantee. So what we see here on the left here is that, uh, so on the x-axis we have problem size. On the y-axis we have the uh, effort required to solve the problem relative to the effort required by A star. And what you can see here is that A star always takes the effort A star takes. That's sort of uh, straightforward. And that as problem size increases, greedy search takes less and less time relative to A star. So by s sacrificing uh, optimal solving, we can go faster, and the gap between these two increases as problem size grows. On the right, we have the unfortunate news. Uh, again, problem size on the x-axis. On the y-axis, now we have solution quality relative to that of A star. So A star always finds the optimal solution. Unfortunately, greedy doesn't, and the gap between the solution found by greedy and the solution found by A star grows as problem size grows. So we can sacrifice optimality to go very quickly, but the solutions can be arbitrarily bad. Bounded suboptimal search tries to find a middle, middle ground between these two extremes of optimal solving and no guarantees whatsoever by finding solutions that are guaranteed to be within some user-specified factor W of optimal as quickly as it possibly can. So uh, one algorithm for this setting is the weighted A-star algorithm, this line in blue. And you can see that it's not really quite as fast as greedy, but it's substantially quicker than A-star. And uh, it doesn't provide optimal solutions, but the solutions are better than that of greedy. And in fact, they're guaranteed to be within some factor, uh, W in this case, of optimal. <clears throat> so uh, there are three really big ideas that I'm going to go through in the talk. And I want to make sure that everyone hears them up front so that if you uh, sort of lose the thread of the conversation, you've at least heard this. Uh, the first is that fight in bounds of optimal search, finding solutions and proving that those solutions are within the bound are really separate tasks. So we're not the first people to have noticed this. Uh, Pearl and Kim, back in the 80s, uh, proposed an algorithm called ASR Epsilon that took advantage of this division of labor. We've sort of been belaboring the point for the last couple of years. It's sort of, it, well, it can lead to, uh, you can substantially reduce the solving time uh, within a bound by paying attention to the fact that you can use separate techniques for finding solutions and for proving that the solutions were within your desired bound. The second big idea is that inadmissible estimates of solution costs can reduce solving time. Um, so in optimal search and in bounded suboptimal search, we require admissible estimates of cost, that is, cost estimates that are guaranteed to return values lower than the true cost to go in order to produce these bounds. So what we see here, um, that's what we see here is a greedy search on such a cost estimate as the red line. The, uh, x-axis is problem size again, the y-axis is uh, effort required to solve the problem, in this case time. Uh, this benchmark will come up again later and I'll explain it thoroughly there. Uh, the green dotted line here though is greedy search on a cost heuristic, except this time we don't constrain the heuristic to always underestimate. This heuristic here is some sort of best effort estimate of the cost to go beneath the node. And just switching the thing that we're searching on from this uh, admissible estimate to this inadmissible estimate allows us to solve problems of larger sizes quicker, uh, more quickly, which is perhaps a useful thing to do. And the third thing is that not only are cost estimates and inadmissible estimates of cost important, occasionally we want to consider the length of solutions as well as the cost of those solutions. 
So if you're traversing some kind of graph, this is really the difference between the sum of the arc costs and the count of the arcs. So the blue line here is a greedy search on the estimate of the number of actions left in the plan as opposed to the estimate of the cost. And you can see that yet again, by searching on this particular uh, criterion greedy, greedily, instead of the cost estimates, we go faster. So the algorithm that I'm presenting in this talk and in the paper, explicit estimation search, is really just the marriage of these three ideas. We do bounding and solving sort of separately, or at least as separately as we can get away with. We use inadmissible estimates of cost in conjunction with uh, admissible estimates of cost to find solutions quickly while proving a bound. And we rely on estimates of distance to make sure that the, sort, the search algorithm goes quickly. So <clears throat> to uh, come back to the idea of boundness of optimal search, remember that sort of the stated goal of boundness of optimal search is what we want to do is we want to uh, find solutions within a suboptimality bound W, but we want to do so as quickly as we possibly can. So uh, the algorithm that probably most people have heard about from this family of algorithms is the weighted A star search algorithm. And what weighted A star does is it evaluates nodes according to the following order. So G of N, the cost of arriving at that node from the start state, plus some weighted factor W times H of N. So W is again the sub suboptimality bound, and H of N is an admissible estimate of the cost to go. So in practice, this can work quite well, but it's sort of an ad hoc approach, right? <clears throat> um, specifically because H of N tells us nothing about how long, how far away we are from a solution. And since it tells us nothing about how far away we are from a solution, it can't really tell us anything about how close we are to solving the problem. And if we're trying to optimize time subject to a suboptimality bound, then we really need to know something about how close we are to solutions. So what I'm going to propose here is an algorithm which expands the node closest to a solution within the suboptimality bound. If this is what bounded suboptimal search is trying to do, I say that this is what the algorithm needs to do then. And I'm going to call that node best d hat. And just more formally, uh, well, yes, best d hat is a node which we estimate to be within the bound, and we think it is as close as, as of all nodes estimated to be within the bound, it's as close to a goal as we can get. Or it's as close to a goal of all open nodes. So to construct bestie hat, we're going to need three uh, separate sources of information, which I'm going to march through now. So the first is H, which is an admissible, co an admissible estimate of cost. I think that uh, for people who have seen heuristic search before, most of you have seen this estimate before. It's the one used by A star. It's the one used by ID A star. I think RBFS also uses it. Um, so, and we're going to use this estimate of cost to produce this lower bound of total cost through a node. So, F of N is G of N, the cost of arriving, plus H of N, the admissible cost to go. This is exactly the evaluation function of A star and ID A star. And we're going to rely on this quantity to prove our bounds. So we keep this around only because at some point we want to show that the solution we return is within the bound provably. The next source of information we're going to take advantage of is H hat of N, which is a potentially inadmissible estimate of the cost to go. So it's sort of our best effort to estimate how expensive a solution beneath a node is. We don't want to always underestimate, we don't want to always overestimate, we just want to be as close to the point as we can get. And uh, we're going to from H hat, we're going to build F hat, which is the total cost, but instead of being a lower bound, now it's our best possible estimate of it. Uh, if you're worried about where we can get these accurate estimates, they can be constructed by hand. We showed earlier this year that they can be learned online during the search, so if you don't want to write one down yourself, you can learn it. The last source of information, oh, right. <clears throat> that was my second point. Inadmissible cost estimates can be more important. The third source of information we're going to use is D hat, a potentially inadmissible estimate of the number of actions between the state and the goal. <clears throat> and recall that I said earlier, searching on distance is faster than cost. And if our goal is to find solutions within the bound as quickly as possible, we're going to want to know what solutions are close to the goal already. So um, D hat has been around for a while, at least since the 80s. Uh, Pearl and Kim suggested it, or sort of proposed it in their A star epsilon out. 
their paper on A star epsilon, which is this paper here. We've been using it for quite a while as well. It's very useful. <clears throat> so, um, using these sources of information, we're going to construct the nodes EES will consider while exploring the search space. So, the first of those is uh, that I'm going to talk about is best F. So, it's the open node, and open nodes are simply those nodes which we have generated but not yet expanded. So those possible solutions we're still considering. With the minimum F value, which uh, you will recall is a lower bound on the total cost of a node. We're also going to make use of best F hat, which is the open node with minimum F hat. So the difference between this node up here, best F, and this node down here, best F hat, is that best F represents sort of a lower bound on the solution cost, and best F hat represents our best estimate on the solution cost. And the nice thing about best F hat is it finally allows us to define best D hat, which is the thing I said we wanted to have, right? So we want best D hat because we're trying to pursue solutions that are as near to the goal as possible while being within the bound. So best D hat, recall, is the estimated W admissible node with minimum D hat. What that means exactly is that it's open, so we've generated it, but not yet expanded it, so it's still open for consideration. And the estimated cost of that node, f hat of that node, is within some bounded factor w of our best estimate of optimal solution cost, f hat of best f hat. And of all of these nodes, all of these nodes that appear to be within the bound by our best estimates, it's the one that looks closest to the goal. So I would like to tell you that the expansion order of EES is to consistently expand SD hat and pursue the shortest solution within the bound and find the solution and return. Unfortunately, this is a bounded suboptimal algorithm, so we have some proving to do. So we can't just expand SD hat. We have to expand SD hat only if the estimated cost of the solution through that node can be shown to be within a factor W of a lower bound of the cost of the optimal solution to the problem. So basically, we only pursue that solution if we can show right now it's within the desired bound. Um, so F of best F is less than the cost of the optimal solution. And it turns out the way we've defined F hat in the paper, it's guaranteed to be at least as large as F. So this proof holds. <coughs> Now, sometimes we can't pursue the shortest solution within the bound because um, the proving the bound doesn't allow us to. So if we can't pursue best D hat, the next thing we think about is pursuing best F hat. So if we can't pursue the nearest bounded solution, or the nearest solution within the bound, we pursue the optimal solution. And we do that for two reasons. Um, proving that an optimal solution within the bound is easy, relatively speaking. And by expanding best F hat, uh, we may be able to consider better nodes for best D hat later because we're pushing a node that's very good closer to a goal, so its D hat may fall below another node's and it may come to the front of that list. But again, we only expand it if we can show it's within the bound right now. And if we can't show that the optimal solution is within our desired bound, well, our desired, or is within the bound right now, our bound is too low. So we expand best F and erase the bound. So, that's EES, uh, and you can see the paper for further justification of the rule, why you actually have to have all of these rules and some subset of it isn't sufficient. So uh, let's talk about some performance results. I'm going to present a subset of the results in the paper. You can look at the <coughs> paper for some more charts of performance. Um, in all of the plots, what we're going to have on the x-axis is the suboptimality bound. So that's the guaranteed solution quality. The solution will be no worse than 1.6 times optimal, for example. On the y-axis, we're always going to be showing CPU time, either directly or on a log scale. EES, uh, there are two variants of it presented in the paper, but it's these algorithms in red and green. And the operative thing to note is that these lines are lower than the other lines, so our algorithm performs better than the previous state of the art. Uh, weighted A star, the algorithm you're all familiar with, I think. A star epsilon, another algorithm which uses distance estimates. And skeptical search, another algorithm which uses inadmissible estimates of cost. 
So by combining separating solving with proving, or finding solutions with proving bounds, by using distance estimates, and by using inadmissible estimates of cost, all three together, we perform better than algorithms that only do one or perhaps two of these things. Uh, oh, the domain, right. So this is the dockyard robot domain. It's the sort of running example from uh, now Traverso and Golob's textbook on automated planning. Uh, the next uh, domain that we have is uh, Vacuum World. It's sort of the first search space example from Russell and Norvig. You have a little rec robot who wants to move around in a grid and suck up some dirt. Uh, again, the x-axis is suboptimality bound. The y-axis is now CPU time on a log scale. And you can see that the two variants of EES are substantially faster than the other menagerie of algorithms. And if we happen to have a variant of the vacuum problem where sucking up dirt makes it harder to move the robot, then uh, the small difference, well, the several times better than other algorithms that we saw in the previous plot becomes a couple of orders of magnitude. A star epsilon is competitive in this domain, but recall that it sort of exploded earlier on the dockyard domain. It also doesn't work well on grids. So it can perform well, but it's not consistent, whereas EES performs well consistently. So uh, to wrap up, <coughs> explicit estimation search is an algorithm which follows uh, fairly directly from the stated goal of bounded and suboptimal search. It provides state-of-the-art performance in that particular setting. It allows us to use inadmissible estimates, both of cost and of solution distance, um, in order to find and while still maintaining bounds, which is very nice. Um, it's relatively robust, but it works especially well in domains with interesting action costs, so where everything doesn't cost just one, but has a wide variety of costs. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> God. So the results you presented show that your algorithm works yeah. faster. Not better. You kept saying it's better. So, but you didn't say anything about the, the quality of the solutions. So, yeah, that's a very insightful question. We do specifically take a hit in terms of solution quality on some of the domains. That's how we end up going faster. Um, so, if your estimates of solution cost are very, very good, then the amount that we are worse than other solvers is not very great. If your estimates of cost are very bad, then we get misled by them. So um, if you want better quality solutions, then you should supply a tighter bound, is what I would really say to that. Could you give some, uh, some further intuition on why you would expand uh, best D hat before best F hat? So if what you want is to find a solution within some fixed factor of optimal as quickly as possible, then what you want to do is pursue the shortest solution. Because the shortest solution and the cheapest solution may be very, very different things. So for example, the shortest solution for me to get home is to hop a cab from here to Freiburg. That's one action, and it's incredibly expensive. Uh, however, the economizing plan where I take a train to the airport, an airport to Basel, a bus from Basel to the train station there, and a train back home, has more actions and will take me longer to find as a result. That was ICAPS. Yeah. We're not in Freiburg today. <laughs> yeah, but I'm going back there. Okay. So. Okay, <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, can you go back to slide 10, I believe? Which one of them? And actually, this one there is good. Okay. Um, so, so I'm just wondering, you know, this, this graph kind of stops at suboptimality 1.6 one one or something. So I got sort of bit by the bug of let's solve the biggest thing we possibly can. It doesn't go all the way down to optimality in this domain. As a result, I can't solve the problems optimally. Right. There are benchmarks in the paper where I do go down to optimality. So do you have any insights what the structural features of those problems are where you really can't reach optimality? Because that seems like an important question, right? And it also seems an important question how close to optimality you can get with this. So it's not necessarily a question of structure so much as it's a question of the power of the admissible heuristic. Because right. we're sort of beholden to that. It, it, it dictates exactly what we can expand. And we have to expand all nodes where their F value is you know, some factor of W within the cost of the solution we want to find eventually. So however, the weaker your heuristic, the larger that set of nodes and the more trouble we're in. 
Um, raising W reduces the size of that set, improving the power reduces the size of that set. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.